Okay, today's stuff we're going to learn is Psachim Daf Son of Tet. Um, with a lot of dedications today, this week's learning is sponsored by Paul and Danielle Nakamuli in honor of her, uh, of Danielle's daughter, Ayelet Yancey's Bat Mitzvah. We're so proud of you and can't wait to see where your Jewish journey takes you. Love, Paul and Ima. Today's daf is also sponsored by Gabrielle Altman in honor of the Yurit sites of the Honorable Miriam Altman, Naomi Rosen, and the Shloshim of Aviva Rolnik, a beloved, cherished, and treasured family and friends whom I will always miss and hold forever in my heart. And by Rachel Gabal in honor of her sister, Ellen Worlin. I'm so honored to be learning daf Yomi with you uh, and alongside you and your daughter, Avigail. You're an inspiring duo. I can't wait to see what the next year of Deputy holds in store. Happy birthday. And by the Hate Family for Rufuash Lemach, Rabbi Joel Cohen, Harav Yoel HaCohen, Ben Dina. Okay, we're going to start at the bottom. We have to just rec- remember the Mishnah. We're dealing with this Mishnah that came up on Samachay Amubet about the list of items that override Shabbat and the ones that of, of um, actions that override Shabbat for the purpose of the Korban Pesach and all the ones that don't. Anything Rabbi Akiva says that could, or also Rabbi Yeshua, that could have been done before Shabbat, you cannot do on on. Shabbat, even if they're only Durabanan in nature, to which Rabbi Lezer disagreed and said, what do you mean? Of course you can. And this matches what he said in the, in, um, the parak of Rabbi Lezer de Mila in, in Shabbat. We're also machshirim Mila, bringing the knife, let's say, to the Brit Mila. That, he says, is Doche Shabbat. It's the same exact Rabbi Lezer, the same opinion, the same approach. And then there was a whole back and forth in the Mishnah, which we said was a bit atypical for the Mishnah. Here we're going to see not only is it atypical for the Mishnah, but we're, besides that, we're going to see lots of other, there was a lot of discussion here, a lot of other bright toad about discussions that ensue between the two of them. And we're going to go through a bunch of the, the, the different parts of their argument. So the first part of the argument where Bielezer had said, isn't it just logical? If Shechita, right, which is Usr by Torah law override Shabbat, wouldn't you say all the more so that... Um, that the Durabanans, right, like carrying outside the Tchum, would override Shabbat. To which Rabbi Yeshua said, we're going to prove it from Yom Tov. Yom Tov, we allow Doraitas, but not Durabanans that you could have done yesterday, right? That you could have brought the food from, you can't bring the food from outside the Tchum on Yom Tov. That's not allowed. To which Rabbi Yeshua said, you're proving to me, Rishut, to Mitzvah, what do you mean? Just because you don't allow it on Yom Tov doesn't mean you wouldn't allow it on Shabbat. So that's where we're going to start with Ravashi. I'm a Ravashi, which we discussed yesterday, right? There's a machloket, is eating a mitzvah on, is it a mitzvah or not, right? Rabbi Lezer obviously thought it wasn't a mitzvah because you could do kulo la Hashem like we saw yesterday. So three lines from the bottom of Samachet, I'm a bet. I'm a Ravashi. Ulamai teka amar Rabbi Lezer nami yom tov reshut, eat le pircha. The fact that he says yom tov is reshut, and therefore don't try to prove to me from yom tov, you could also knock that out. How so? My Yom Tov she tirba malachasha reshut lo he tir shvut sheima Shabbat shelo he tirba elam malachasha mitzvah ain odin shelo ta tir shvut sheima. Just because on Yom Tov they didn't allow it, that's because it's reshut. When it comes to a mitzvah, or right when it comes to a mitzvah shelo he tirba elam malachasha mitzvah ain odin shelo ta tirba shvut sheima. Right when Yom Tov they only allowed. Melachav Rashut. And yet, right, they still didn't, in a, when it's a mitzvah, and they didn't even allow der, uh, derabanan, Shabbat, which they didn't, uh, tirba ela, they only allowed. Shabbat is more limited. Why? Shabbat, they only allowed shvut of a mitzvah. So all the more so, we shouldn't allow, right, Shabbat didn't allow anything of, of Rashut. And it's Yantif allowed Rashut. They allowed you to do, right, for the purposes of just regular eating. And yet they limited you only to Doraita. So in Shabbat, when they don't even allow things of Rashut, right, what do they do? They allowed only Melachav Mitzvah. So if that's the case, they're already more limiting. So all the more so, they're going to be limiting and not permit the Rabbanan. So that could have been a claim we could have used against Rabbi Le'ezer. So then they say... Why did Rabbi Le'ezer not say that? Because Rabbi Le'ezer, Shvuta Mitzvah Adifle, he thinks a mitzvah is more important. In other words, he thinks again, for a mitzvah will allow anything. So that's why it's not really a good claim against him, or it's a claim he could have argued against. Tanya. Now we bring a bright. Amar Rabbi Le'ezer. Umali, okay, it'll be very helpful if you follow along in the sheet, because it's quite a complicated doc um, in terms of the flow. So I tried to organize it so that you can see what we're up to, and I'll try to, you know, as I teach, I'll also kind of keep things 
keep going back so that I, we keep it in order. So now we bring again another Brita. Like I said in the beginning, we're going to have more Brita with more discussions between the two. Amar Rabbi Eliezer, Umali im dachum achshirei mitzvah shel achar shchita at ha-shabbat, dit avad le-mitzvah, lo yitchum achshirei mitzvah shel afnei shchita at ha-shabbat, which things were allowed in the Mishnah, remember? Shechita, Zrika, okay, those are the main parts of the Korban. And then we even allowed you to clean out the insides and sacrifice the parts on the altar that really could wait till tomorrow and also are not critical parts of the Mitzvah. The Mitzvah is already done. When you're finished with Zrika, you're basically finished with the Mitzvah. Yes, you have some things to finish up, but the main parts are finished. Now, think about it. If you're going to permit something when it comes to a Mitzvah, what are you going to permit? You're going to permit what is... Um, necessary to fulfill the mitzvah. At this point, you finish fulfilling the mitzvah. So what are we going to say here? If that's the case, then if we allow things, once the mitzvah is finished, wouldn't you think it would be logical to permit things in order to do the mitzvah? Like bringing the animal from outside the tchum? It's much more logical that if we're going to permit something, we're going to permit what enables you to do the mitzvah and not once you're already finished with the mitzvah and enables you to do some extra things that aren't critical to the mitzvah. So the fact that we allow that category must mean that we should also allow the original, right? The earlier category. So Amar Le Rabbi Akiva, what's Rabbi Akiva's answer? He's going to give two answers to this claim. He says, wait a minute. What you're saying makes no sense because you're looking at it from the wrong perspective. What enables us to do all the stuff after the sacrifice? The fact that we already push Shabbat aside for this mitzvah. In other words, what happened? And this is an interesting perspective. We didn't talk about this really yet, but Tumah Hutrabat Sibor is the same thing. When you say Tumah Hutrabat Sibor, when the majority of the community is Tameh, we can push off, right? The issue of Tumah. It's an irrelevant point. Yeah. The wording is hutra, but it also comes up dechuya. Is it dechuya? Like we just ignore everything? It's as if we've overridden it and there's no issue whatsoever? Or is it just hutra? Is it just permitted? Which means we still have to look and check and make sure everything else is in, in check. Or do we say kind of everything's just pushed off? So when it comes to Shabbat and you slaughter the animal and you do the zrika and all that's forbidden by Torah law, but yet we push Shabbat aside. Shabbat has been pushed aside for this mitzvah. At this point, anything you do after, like Shabbat's been pushed aside for this sacrifice. So we've already moved Shabbat kind of to the side and said, listen, when it comes to this korban, we ignore the fact that it's Shabbat. So you can do everything you need for the korban, even if it's not critical. But that's not true before you slaughter the animal. When does the Shabbat get pushed off? When you start slaughtering the animal. So anything before, Shabbat's not yet pushed aside. So that's one reason he gives. The second reason, Maybe you'll find that this, that maybe you'll go to sacrifice the animal and you'll find maybe the animal has a blemish. Or you'll slaughter it and you'll mess up the slaughtering. Or, you know, something could happen along the way. Someone will think, lo lishma. And you'll mess up the korban. So therefore, when will we allow you to override Shabbat? Once the korban's finished, then these other things, you can still do them. Because you know your korban went through perfectly. But before, when you're just bringing the animal, you don't even know. It's like a good example, right? You don't know. Let's say, I'll give you a, a relevant example for this. Let's say... Um, a doctor gets a call, someone's, you know, on their, I don't know, very sick. They might die, but, you know, come help. You maybe could save their lives. And what happens if the doctor gets there and the person's already dead? So he was Michalel Shabbat for no reason, right? So obviously, right, we allow this because maybe he'd be able to save him. But in the end, he might not even get there in time. And it would end up, right, retroactively that he hadn't, that he had been Michalel Shabbat, that's crazy. Shabbat for no reason. So it's the same thing here. That maybe, we're not going to allow you to bring the animal because maybe this animal won't even go through in the end. There'll be some problem along the way. And then it turns out you'll have desecrated Shabbat for no reason. Once you've done the shechita, the shechita, then we'll allow some other things because we know the sacrifice went through. 
Well, the second claim obviously is going to have some problems because they're going to reject this and say, Yihachi, if that's the case, Mishchat nami lo nishchat. Shema yimat se zevach pasuvan, im sama chalala tashabad lamafreya. Well, then you should even be allowed to slaughter the animal because you could still mess up the sacrifice after that, or even the slaughtering itself. Maybe you'll mess up the, the shechita. So then you shouldn't allow anything be, for this reason. Maybe it'll be disqualified. So therefore, and we all know that you do. So therefore, Ella, what happened here with these two claims of Rabbi Akiva? This is something similar to what we said the other day. Ella ha'amr le'bereisha uparche. He really said the second claim first. And Rabbi Eliezer rejected it, even though it doesn't say so in the Brayta. It's just that it's obvious you can reject that claim because then you wouldn't allow Shechita at all. And Hadar Amar Lehach Dimalim Dachu. And then he went back and said the first answer. So in other words, we had it as one, two. It really was two came first. Rabbi Eliezer rejected it, and that's why he brought answer number one that appears as number one by us, but was really answer number two. It also explains why there were two points that Rabbi Akiva made because one got rejected. Okay, moving on. Now we have this problem that was a little bit confusing in the Mishnah, and I already kind of told you a little bit about what was going to be in today's daf at the time, because it's hard to explain the Mishnah without it, which is, Rabbi Akiva comes along and says that, um, that haza'a, right, I'm going to prove my point, because if someone's standing on the seventh day of having been a Tmei mate on Yudalid, we do not allow them to sprinkle the, blood, the water, the purification waters on this person, Okay, and that's a machshire mitzvah. It enables him to do the mitzvah, and yet we don't allow it. So what do we say? Here you see, ah, all these things don't override Shabbat. To which Rabbi Lezer said, what do you mean? I disagree with you about this. I think you can sprinkle the purification waters. To which Rabbi Kiva responded something very weird. It comes at the top of Samach Vav Amar Aleph. Amar lo Rabbi Kiva, ochiluf. I'll take what you said and I'll reverse it. The logic that you were using, I'll reverse your logic, and I'll tell you something that's going to come out absurd, from what you're saying, even though it's not really from what he's saying, because he says, he starts off with, against Rabbi Lezer, that has a, ah. Rabbi Lezer said, sprinkling the water over at Shabbat. And Rabbi Kiva says, Maim has a, ah, mishum shfut, Shabbat. He just repeats his claim that I don't think the sprinkling overrides Shabbat. And since it doesn't override Shabbat, if that doesn't override Shabbat, we're going to take your logic and say, well, then Shechita shouldn't override Shabbat. And we know that's not the case. Right? To which Rabbi Lezer gets very angry at him and says, and we'll see, in today's stuff, he gets even more angry than appears in our Mishnah. And he says, Akiva, Akarta Masha Ketuba Torah. You're, what you're saying is so absurd, and you can't possibly even suggest such a thing because you're overriding something that says explicitly in the Torah, because it says, Moado, you do it in its proper time, even if it's on Shabbat, you obviously slaughter it on Shabbat. So there's a few weird things here, right? The real difficult thing is, how did, why did Rabbi Akiva respond to Rabbi Lezer, who said, Haza'ah overrides Shabbat by saying Haza'ah doesn't override Shabbat and then making a logical conclusion based on Rabbi Lezer's logic saying, I'm going to come to an absurd conclusion. So we have a few things to explain here. We'll get to them as we go on. So Tanya, here's a version of the Brayta, as I said, with a more harsh response of Rabbi Lezer. Very harsh, you would say. Tanya, so the Brayta says like this, Amrali Rabbi Lezer, Akiva, Bishchita heshivtani, Bishchita tehe mitato. First of all, he talks about him in the third person. I guess he doesn't want to say this directly. But what he says is, you responded to me with some ridiculous, preposterous thing about shechita. You're going to be slaughtered. Your death is going to be a death through slaughtering, which is interesting because Rabbi Akiva doesn't exactly get slaughtered, but we know he, right, his, his skin gets combed by the Romans, right, by these hot combs, and he gets killed in a very, um, very cruel manner. And maybe it's because of this curse that Rabbi Lezer ben Horkin has puts upon him. Okay, he says, you're so chutzpadik with your chutzpadik question, you're going to end up right. And Rabbi Lezer ben Horkin, as we know from the Tanur Rosh Lachnai story, he's very strong in his opinions. And here you see, right, he went a little bit far, maybe too far, and, and cursed him from it. And we'll see even why it's even the worst that he cursed him, because in fact, it seems like Rabbi Lezer was, was incorrect in this whole story. Amarlo, so Rabbi Akiva's response in this Braita is, al tachpereni bishatadin, don't start, you know, telling me, oh, I'm going to be judged for this. I learned this directly from you. What did I learn directly from you? And now we see why he repeats his claim, even though it goes against Rabbi Eliezer. He's trying to remind Rabbi Eliezer what he said. You know, he didn't want to say this directly before, but now he says it. You taught me. It's a derabanan. And it doesn't override Shabbat. You can't sprinkle the waters on Shabbat. So here he says, right? This is, 
this you you basically taught us this so i don't know why you're disagreeing and that's why he repeats himself to remind rabbi Leezer what he originally taught him so now we have to try to understand rabbi Leezer. if rabbi Leezer taught this to rabbi akiva why is he changing his tone on it why does he now say it's not the case that he thinks has does override shabbat so we're going to have two explanations. We're going to have Ula, which in the end the Gemara is going to reject, and then we're going to bring another explanation. Amar Ula, Rabbi Leizer ki Agmare, Hazaa de Truma Agmare, de Truma Gufa lo Dachia Shabbat. When Rabbi Leizer taught it, he didn't teach it about this. He didn't teach Hazaa of its mate in order to allow him to do the Korban Pesach. That he doesn't think overrides Shabbat. He taught it about sprinkling the waters to enable a coin to eat Truma. That overrides that right so that's where he says it doesn't override shabbat in other words i think i might have said the reverse right now let me just clarify rabbi i don't remember what i said a second ago but rabbi Leezer, when it comes to hazaa okay in our context for the korban pesach he will allow it but when it comes to truma just to allow a coin to eat truma he won't allow it okay so what happened rabbi Leezer taught it about truma so now let's go through the discussion according to this so rabbi akiva it's not that Rabbi Akiva misunderstood Rabbi Leizer. He knew what Rabbi Leizer said. When he responded to him, but you, right, well, he didn't say you said, but he was trying to remind him that you said that Haza'a does not override Shabbat. He meant Haza'a to sprinkle waters to make someone pure so that they could eat truma. You said that doesn't override Shabbat. Now, why is he making this comparison? They're two different things, but they're not so different. Why are they kind of the same? If you think that the sprinkling in order to allow one to eat truma doesn't override Shabbat. What that's let's put it into a category. What's that category? Shehi mitzvah vihi mishum shvut. It's a mitzvah. What's the mitzvah? The mitzvah is to eat truma. Okay, this is very interesting and I could spend the whole shear on this, but I'll just mention it very briefly. From here, the, they derive that it's a mitzvah to eat truma. You might not have thought that. It's a mitzvah to take, separate the truma and give it to the Kohen, but then the Kohen, like he's eating his regular food, his food is truma, but apparently it's a mitzvah. The Rambam says you would make a bracha. When you eat truma, you make a special bracha. Maybe it's ala chilat truma. I don't remember the wording, but I found it in the Rambam. He says you make a bracha on eating truma. And the source, the truma is a mitzvah, is our Gemara. Okay? They get it from here, that there must be a mitzvah about eating truma, and they connect it to a pasuk. Okay, again, like I said, I'm not going to get into all the details, but there's a whole issue about this. So anyway, he says, here you have, it's a mitzvah to eat truma, and yet we don't allow you to sprinkle the waters on the purification waters to a lab on Shabbat to enable someone to eat, do the mitzvah of eating truma. And therefore, you shouldn't allow it to for the Pesach either. That's Rabbi Akiva's claim. So what's, so now what happened? This is what you call classic miscommunication. Okay, so Rabbi Akiva quotes Rabbi Lazar perfectly. He just didn't say sprinkling for truma, but that's what he meant. He knew that Rabbi Lazar only said it by sprinkling of truma, but what he was trying to say is this is no different. To which Rabbi Eliezer hears him say, now whether, he didn't say you said it, but he was saying this is the halacha, that it doesn't override Shabbat. The Husaval, when he heard him say this, when Rabbi Lazar heard this, he said, Haza'a de Pesach kamotivle. He thought that he was responding regarding Hazaa and Pesach. And to that, right, even Rabbi Akiva didn't think that Rabbi Lezer would said that, but he was trying to just make a connection. And yes, I see in the chat someone saying, it's not exactly the same, but it's true. It's not the same. One is a mitzvah that will pass and one is a mitzvah that won't pass. But still, in other words, again, Rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer is talking in concepts here. Mitzvah, reshut, right? So he's trying to knock out his claim and say, here's an issue for a mitzvah and we don't over, let it override. So, he thought he was talking about Pesach, and therefore he got upset with him, and he said, "There's no such thing as Av Pesach does override Shabbat." Okay, so anyway, that's what he says. Mativ Raba, Raba doesn't, and then the whole issue here, according to Ula, is that there was a total miscommunication between the two. Rabbi Akiva was quoting Rabbi Eliezer when it came to Truma, and Rabbi Eliezer thought he was talking about Pesach, and he basically says that's totally not true, and you're talking, you know, nonsense because he didn't understand him. Okay, this is classic. You know, you have to listen or, or if you're not sure, ask. You know, anyway, that's his reading. Rabbi doesn't like this reading. Mativ Rabbi. He questions it like this. And he says, but look at the upcoming, the, I'm going to quote your Brita, where it's clear that he was talking about Hazaa sprinkling for the Korban Pesach. And here it says it explicitly. So you can't claim that based on this version of this Brita. 
Hishiv Rabbi Akiva Vama. Rabbi Akiva responds and says, Hazaat Meimei Tochiach. The sprinkling of its Meimei will prove it. Shechal Shvi Yishelo Liyop HaShabadu Ba'erev HaPesach. Here's exactly our case. He's on the seventh day. It's Erev Pesach. And obviously, what's he doing the sprinkling for? For the Karba Pesach, not for eating Truma. Shehi mitzvah. Vehi mishum shfud. It's a mitzvah. And it's shfud. Vehi na docheta Shabbat. And it doesn't override Shabbat. So this version clearly knocks out Ula. Obviously, Ula didn't have this brayta, But Rabbi had this brayta and says, basically, you can't say that. Ela vaday hazaa de Pesach admoi. For sure, he was talking about hazaa of Pesach. Okay? And not hazaa of Truma. So now, back to the original question. So they, sometimes they don't repeat the question, but now they're repeating the question in case you don't remember what we're up to. So if that's the case, we'll answer it in one way. Now we have to come up with a different answer to this question. If Rabbi really taught that, then why did he change his mind? And now all of a sudden he doesn't think that anymore. So Rabbi Gamre it akarle. He obviously forgot what he had said. Okay, it happens sometimes, right? So it's interesting. According to Ula, the whole issue is that they're both very common things. One is someone misinterprets what someone else is saying, right? You don't listen properly. And according to this, somebody's forgetful, right? We all know that. Sometimes you forget something that you yourself said. And Rabbi Kiva is trying to refresh his memory. And that's how Rabbi Kiva repeats what he said about it's not, it doesn't override Shabbat because he was figured if he keeps saying it over and over, maybe it'll jar Rabbi Lezer's memory. Also something that we know, right? If somebody says something, it might jar your memory and remind you. So why didn't he just say so explicitly? Savar lav orech ara. He says it's just not an appropriate manner to speak that way to your rabbi. Now I told you this when we learned it in the Mishnah, right? That Abai always says this to Rabbi Yosef, but you're the one who taught us. So some people speak in that way, but right in this case he didn't. He tried to do it in a much more gentle way and look what happened right he gets cursed in the end for it and he didn't it's almost interesting it's kind of saying maybe even though there's this issue of respect for your rabbi sometimes you're better off saying things explicitly because look what happened in the end rebel misunderstood right miss rebel basically didn't get the hint and got very angry at him and cursed him so now we have to go back to now we have a more basic question has on my time a lodache shabbat why does Hazaah not override Shabbat? So again, we have, right, I see what, Caroline, it's a good suggestion. Maybe he was trying to be careful because he knew Rabbi Lezer had a bad temper, right? In the end, it came back to haunt him. It didn't work, but maybe also that's why he was being more cautious. It like, could be Rabbi Yosef, first of all, forgot a lot of his Torah in the end of his life and probably was conscious of the fact that he had forgotten a lot of his Torah, so it wasn't a, a big insult to say so, right? He knew that that was the case. In this case, maybe it was a one-off and he forgot it and it was, you know, it was... It was, uh, you know, he didn't want to exactly say it explicitly. So in any case, he did it in this way, although it really wasn't so successful. But now we have to understand, really, so according to this, Rabbi Akiva thinks, Haza'az not toche Shabbat, even Rabbi Eliezer apparently thought so, he just didn't remember that he said so. So why? Why is it not toche Shabbat? What's the problem with Haza'ah? Michdi tiltule ba'almahu, titche Shabbat mishum Pesach. If it's really only the issue of muktza, okay, now why is it muktza? What's muktza? Something that has no purpose. So this water, it's true, it purifies you, but it in and of itself is just water. It's not water that you drink, so it does, it's not a food or drink. It's not a utensil that you can use for something. So it theoretically is something that you use that is useful only to do something that you can't do on Shabbat. So basically what they're saying is, why wouldn't it be docha Shabbat? It's only muktza, and that's pretty light. We should be able to override this. So what do they say? So what does he say? Oh, the issue is, okay, and you might think, you might realize this falls into a very famous category of items called Gzera de Rabba. Rabba himself says when it comes to Shofar, Lulav, and Megillah, okay, all these happening on holidays, if they fall on Shabbat, you're not allowed to do the mitzvah. This is why we don't blow shofar on Shabbat. We don't take a lulav on Shabbat. Both of those happen this year. And we don't read Megillah on Shabbat either. Why don't we do these? Because these are all things, Rabba says, we're worried that if we these have implements involved, and if you forget them, you might have to end up carrying them, Arbam or Shadarbim. So you don't do it when they fall out on Shabbat. Now, people all try to make theories about what's the unique about these three things and why. It's interesting because... All the theories don't include this one, but this is also Xerah de Rabbe. He says the reason here fits in with his 
anima, I mean, you know, is belief in these other areas, that there's a concern that well, you'll carry this sprinkling water, these waters, purification waters, for cubits in Rashid Arabim, and that will be the problem. So there we get to a possible issue of a deoraita. Okay, it's a, it's only a derabana. Maybe you will, but maybe you'll be you'll transgress a deoraita. So now, now they say, even according to you, Rabba, Rabbi Leezer, Neabre, according to Rabbi Leezer, it shouldn't even be a problem to carry a four Amad and Rashid Arabim. Why is that? Daha Amar Rabbi Leezer, it's his famous Shita, Machshirei Mitzvah, Duchim Mitzvah Shabbat. He thinks anything for preparation for a mitzvah overrides Shabbat. So what if you carry it for Amad and Rashid Arabim? It's, it's enabling you to do a mitzvah to bring the Korban Pesach, so it should be fine. Amre, so what's the reason? Okay, we're now going to have one reason. We're going to get into depth into this. We're going to eventually reject it. And then we're going to go to a second reason. Okay, so again, like I said, you got to keep the structure in mind. Our question now is, why, if Rabbi Eliezer thinks that all machshirei mitzvah dochim et shabbat why would he think, and as the Rabbi Yekiva quoted him as saying, that the sprinkling waters don't override Shabbat in order to do the Karban Pesach? So he says something very interesting, this theory. Amre, it's only when the when does something override Shabbat when the person can do the mitzvah okay when a person is higher than the mitzvah because of their status right now they have an obligation in the mitzvah that's when we allow anything to do to, to override Shabbat in order to do the mitzvah but in our case, we have a person who's tamei meit. He can't do the mitzvah of Pesach right now. If he stays in this status, he can't. So right now, he doesn't have a chiyuv on him for Korban Pesach because he's a tamei meit. So therefore, we don't allow overriding of a mitzvah in order to enable him to do a mitzvah because it's not a mitzvah that's on him right now because he can't do the mitzvah right now, right? Normally, what would happen? He'd be pushed off to Pesach Shani. So he doesn't have a mitzvah upon him right now. So what he says is this fascinating line, the Gemara says, if someone is not ra'oi to do a mitzvah, in other words, the mitzvah for some reason is not relevant, there's some barrier between him and the mitzvah, then that person can't override Shabbat for anything. So now we're going to question this. I'm a rabbi. Well, first, actually, before we question, we're going to come to a certain rabbi is going to say, one can conclude from your lahalacha the following. Lediver rabbi liyaz. According to this then, okay, so let's go back to our machshire milah case. So you can do anything for brit milah. Brit milah override Shabbat. So you can override Shabbat for the purposes of Brit Milah. Now, one thing they did with babies before the Brit Milah, they would warm them in a hot bath, okay? And that would kind of get them ready for the Brit Milah. Without that, they wouldn't do a Brit Milah, it seems. So what does he say? Katam bari, if you have a healthy baby, mechamin lo chamin lavroto lemulo b'shabbat. You can warm up water for him to lahavroto, to make, kind of prepare him for the Brit Milah and give him the Brit Milah on Shabbat because he, a katan, that's bari, is healthy, he's allowed to do a brit milah. But de hachazele, because he's ra'oi, so you can override Shabbat. But a katan chole, if a katan is sick, in machamim lo chamim la havroto alimulo, de halo chazele. You can't warm up water in order to get him, and as, let's say he's a little bit sick, needs warming. Once you warm him, he'll be able to do the brit milah, we'll be able to do the brit milah on him. That's not allowed, because right now he's not ra'oi. So it comes out this weird thing. If the katan is healthy, you can warm the water, which isn't really necessary, right? So in a minute, we're going to say that. But so I'm a rabbi. Ibariu, lava lechamim la Wait a minute. If he's perfectly healthy, you could do the brit milah without the water, then how can we let you warm the water? Because you don't really need the water to do the mitzvah. So el amarava, he says, no, it's actually viewed a little bit differently. Hakocholin henet samila. Everyone's considered sick when it comes to a brit milah, meaning every child, every infant is not really ready for the brit milah until you warm up this water and, and bathe them in the water. Which means, all infants are not ra'oi for brit milah on Shabbat, only if you bathe them. Therefore, you can't bathe them. You can't, sorry, you can't warm the water to bathe them. The issue is warming the water, not bathing. So therefore, what do you have to do? You have to warm the water before Shabbat. You can only use water that was warm before Shabbat. If you didn't warm the water, then the baby's not chayav in brit milah, basically, because there's a barrier between him and brit milah, and then you can't override Shabbat for that baby. Some people say, so then why don't we just create a situation where you don't warm the water, then the baby's not chayav on Shabbat, because why should we override Shabbat if we don't have to, right? This whole, you can get off at all sorts of things about this, but I'm not going to go there right now. Okay, so now, basically, he 
so he basically questions this whole thing, right? He says, sorry, he says, right, this halacha that you said, I don't think is really a halacha for me. But now we have a question on this, this theory. This theory says if you're not ra'oi, you can't be mechalel, right? You're, if you're not ra'oi, let's say you're a tame, you're standing on seventh day, you're actually not obligating Korma Pesach, right? Because you're not ra'oi. So therefore, you can't be docha Shabbat because you're not ra'oi. So now, the, it, Abba is going to bring a big question on this. Arel Shalomal Anush Karek Divrei Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer himself, we were trying to explain Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer himself says, if you're an Arel, you didn't get circumcised yet. And you don't circumcise, you could theoretically, we're talking about someone who could circumcise himself. You don't get circumcised on Erev Pesach. And you don't do the Karma Pesach. You get Karet. Because you basically did not, you, you could have done the Karma Pesach by circumcising yourself and you didn't. So you get Karet. So now, what did we say? The Tame person who needs to sprinkle himself day number seven, but it's Shabbat, so we can't do it. Why can't he do it? Because he's not actually obligated in Korban Pesach because he's exempt right now because he falls into one of the exempt categories. Likewise, the Arel. The Arel is not Ra'oi right now to do a Korban Pesach, so why is he getting Karet for not doing it? So, Alma Rame Chiyuve Aleh. Right, so from the fact that he's anush karet, it shows he is obligated. Just because there's some barrier between him and the mitzvah doesn't mean he's not obligated. He is obligated. So I'm a rabba, kasava rabbi Eliezer. So in order to answer this question, Rabbi says Arel is different from Tameh. It's a little bit complicated until we get to his answer. He's going to say there's three things. Okay, we don't exactly get where he says this, but he says Rabbi Eliezer must hold the following three things. In which case, once we explain these three things, we're going to see that Arel is different from Tameh. And that's why Arel gets karet, but a Tameh, theoretically, we're going to say, wouldn't really get karet because right now he doesn't have an obligation upon him. Okay? And that's why you can't, they're both connected. If he's not obligated, if he's not going to get karet for not doing the Korban Pesach, it means because he's not obligated right now, he's exempt, which means that he doesn't, that you're not allowed to desecrate Shabbat to get him to the stage where he can actually do the mitzvah. So, Rabbi says, Kasava Rabbi Lezer, Rabbi Lezer must hold number one. What does this mean? This means that if you're a Tame Sheretz and you're standing on the 14th, we already explained that if normally a Tame Sheretz, what does you do? It goes to the mikvah in the morning and then, let's say, so it's later on your Dalit, you can slaughter the Korban Pesach for him even though he has to wait till nighttime to be Tahol. Remember, you have to wait till sunset or till Tzedek Kochavim, really, night the stars come out. But at that point, what happens? He, you can slaughter the Korban Pesach for him because he doesn't have to eat it till nighttime anyway, and it's only eating that's the issue right now. What if he didn't go to the mikvah? But theoretically, he could go to the mikvah anytime today and become tahol. So they say, you're, according to what Rabbi says, Rabbi Lezer holds, you don't slaughter a Korban Pesach if he hasn't yet gone to the mikvah. Okay? He's not included in this. Okay? We'll get to why this is relevant soon. Vekol, number two. Kol she'ilu b'yachid nitche. If an individual would be pushed off to Pesach Sheni for whatever issue it is, in other words, if it's an issue that would allow the individual to do the Pesach Sheni, then B'tzibur Avde Betuma. Then the community is able to then do it. If the whole community had that same issue, they would be allowed to do it as a community without having to go through a purification process, right? This is Tuma Hutra B'tzibur. V'chol Milta, number three, anything to eat to B'tzibur, eat to B'yachid, Anything that applies to the tzibor applies to the individual. We're going to see in a minute what this means. It's a little hard to understand yet. It's a little up in the air. The kol melta de leita b'tzibor, and anything that tzibor is not required to do, leita b'yachid, the individual is not required to do. So this is what he establishes. Now, what's the relevance of all this? He says, are lut, so let's take examples. Are lut. De'i kulit tzibor are ninu. Now we'll understand what that last line meant. If the whole community were uncircumcised, Erev Pesach, what would we do? We'd say we're doing a massive circumcision for everybody and we do the Pesach. You wouldn't say, oh, we're going to allow uncircumcised people to bring the Korban Pesach because the whole Tzibor is Tameh. No, we don't do that. So therefore, and that's also connected with anything that Yachid Nidche Le Pesach Sheni, which is not Arel, right, isn't something that the, the Tzibor does, right? I was going to say this also, right? Alana points out in Sefer Yoshua, remember there was this big, massive circumcision done right before the Korban Pesach. So they really get it from there. Um, okay, so now, Nami Amrinam Lehu Kum Mahova Avi Pischa. So therefore for the Yachid, 
when Yachid is standing an individual, on Erev Pesach, and he's uncircumcised, what do we say to him? So now this is whatever we, we tell the seaboard to do, we tell the individual. If we tell the whole community, go get circumcised, so that we can bring in the Korban Pesach, we're going to also tell the individual, go get circumcised. That's why the Yarel gets karet, if he doesn't do that. The Ilomayo, the Avid, Anush karet. Okay, so if he doesn't do it, he's going to get karet. But Tuma, what if the majority of the community is Tmein? What do we say? You don't have to purify themselves. We don't say everybody go purify themselves. What do we say? Everyone can come Tmein into the temple. No problem. There's a big exemption. Therefore, now let's take it to our individual. Therefore, our individual is also exempt. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. We said, Ein Shochatim for this person. So because Ein Shochatim, what does that teach us? If you don't slaughter for someone who hasn't gone to the mikveh yet, who's coming on day number seven, it means they're pushed off to Pesach Sheni. If they're pushed off to Pesach Sheni, that means it's something that the community wouldn't, right? Anything that the, an individual gets pushed off to Pesach Sheni, the community can do Pesach Rishon. Betuma. If they can do Betuma, they don't need to purify themselves on Erev Pesach. Therefore, he doesn't need to purify himself on Erev Pesach to be Ra'oi to bring the Korban Pesach. And therefore, he doesn't get carried. And therefore, he's different from the Arel. So this was all to explain why that Arel source is not a question on the theory that if you're not Ra'oi, right? If you are Ra'oi, then you're going to, if you're not Ra'oi, like you might have thought the Arel is not Ra'oi, why does he get carried? That's because this is different. It's not the same kind of Ra'oi, okay? They're different. So that's what Rabbi answers. But now we're going to have two questions on this. The first one we'll answer. The second one we're not going to answer. I'm Rabbi, and we're not going to have an answer, and therefore we're going to have to bring a different explanation. We're going to reject that whole theory that if you're not Ra'oi, you don't have to bring the Korban Pesach, okay? Which means then, if you're not Ra'oi, we're not going to be able to override Shabbat for you. So I'm Rabbi, Rafuna Barit, Rabbi Yeshua, Le Rabbi. First question. First of all, you say anything that ain't bitzibor, ain't biyachid. Well, here's a thing that isn't bitzibor, but is biyachid. What is that? Hare Pesach Sheni, the whole concept of Pesach Sheni, Leite B'Tzibor. The whole community can't go bring Pesach Sheni. It's only for individuals. Ish, ish. Ve'ite B'Yachid, and yet it is by individuals. So Amar Le, he says, that's not a question. Shane Hatam, Da'ha'avid Le Tzibor B'Rishon. The Tzibor did it, and it's, Pesach Sheni is just a, is, is a, is an outgrowth of Pesach Rishon. It means the Tzibor did it in Pesach Rishon, so therefore the individual could do it in Pesach Sheni. This makes it sound like, by the way, if there were a year where everyone was Tameh, and, or everyone was Tameh, let's say they were all Zavim and Mitzoraim and Yoldod and Nidod and all that. And they didn't, they, who is not allowed to do a Bituma, and they didn't do Pesach Rishon. Sounds like individuals that year would not do Pesach Sheni. Okay, that's what it seems to be indicating here. Okay, fine. We answered the first question. But now we have a second question that we're not going to be able to answer. Now we're going to bring another source that seems to disagree. Yachol lo yehanush karet ele shayat ahor v'shelo ayabaderech rechoka. Now, the Pasuk, when it talks about who gets karet, it says, when it talked about Pesach Sheni, these people are put off to Pesach Sheni. And then it said, an Isha Sheru Tahul, if you are pure on Pesach Rishon, Ubederach Loaya, and he wasn't far away from the temple, Vichadala Sata Pesach, and he didn't do the Korban Pesach, this is Bamid Bartet Yugimel, Vinichrita Nefeshimeyameah, he gets cut off, karet. So, what did they say here? You might have thought, Lo yehanush karet ele shaya tahor v'shelo yabaderech rechokah. It sounds like maybe only those two individuals get karet. If you're tahor or if you're v'derech rechokah. Arel v'tamei sheretz v'shar kol etzmei minayin. Where do you get that in Arel and etzmei sheretz? And those people also were going to get karet if they didn't purify themselves in time. Tamu lomar v'ha'ish. Because it says v'ha'ish and not just ish, but it adds and the, it includes more people. So we could become a hot now. What are we going to say from this? Midikamahadar atame, the fact that it's specifically talked about atame sheret and added him and said, well, he wasn't, it wasn't obvious he was going to be included, but in the end we include him, but we have to explain why we include him. Kasavar, it must be this source holds, ain shochatim bezorkin atame sheret, which would mean that it goes with what Rabbi claimed Rabbi Eliezer holds, which is, it must be that you can't slaughter the Korban Pesach for Tmei Sheretz, because if you could, He'd be no different. If you say this person can be part of your Korban Pesach, even if he hasn't purified himself, then what would you say? Then you'd say the Tmei Sheretz is no different from a regular Tahor person, and you wouldn't need a special Pesach to say, well, he gets Karet, because if you can slaughter the Pesach for him, and yet he doesn't do it, 
Obviously, he's going to get kareev. He's like a regular person that you can start the Pesach for and doesn't do it. So the fact that they exclude him from the rule and have to say, how do we know he's included and specifically come up with a special drasha means that shochat ein shochatim v'zorkin at mesheretz. Okay, so I'll read it inside now. Because ish shochatim v'zorkin at mesheretz, if you could, lama leila duri alei hainu tahor. He'd basically be just like a Torah person. He'd be no different. So therefore, in this case, we have a case of this Tana holds, ancient Chantim Zorkin, like we said, that's what Rabbi Leazar holds. Alma, and what do you see here though? Afal Gav de Lochaze, Chiyuva Ale, even though he's now Ra'oi, he has a Chiyuva Ale. He's going to get Karet. What did, what was the whole theory there? You're not going to get Karet if you don't, right? And that's why we don't allow you to sprinkle the water. So now, right, here it says, he, uh, he has a Chiyuva on him. Afal Gav de Lete Bitsibor, Itebe Yachid. And even though, it's not B'tzibor. The Tzibor wouldn't need to purify themselves. This Yachid does need to purify himself because if he doesn't, he's going to get carried according to the source. So therefore, what do you see? Rabbi Lezer, this doesn't, this doesn't fit with what we just said Rabbi Lezer holds. So we're still stuck with why doesn't, ha- if, if he was going to get carried, then the Hazaah should override Shabbat according to Rabbi Lezer's theory that Machshi Rei Mitzvah Duchim Mitzvah Shabbat. You can't say he's not Rawi. He is Rawi to do the Korban Pesach because you can, right? So basically, this doesn't work. So we're back to square one, which is why does Rabbi Lezer not allow Hazaaf? He allows all sorts of other things. Ela Amarava, Kasava Rabbi Lezer, Shochatim Vizorkin Alt Mesheretz. It must be misunderstood, Rabbi Lezer. He does hold, not like Rabbi said. He holds Shochatim Vizorkin Alt Mesheretz. He is reward to bring the Korban. Vihu Adin Litme Mepeshvishelo, not just a Tumat Sheretz, also someone who's on the seventh day and needs sprinkling. You can't do the Korban Pesach for them. So then, <clears throat> back to our question. If you can, why, why do you not? Why are you not allowed to sprinkle the waters on them? Oh well, that's because they can do. You can slaughter the korban pesach for them, even if they haven't sprinkled the water. Which means that they can be part of the korban pesach even without that. Which means you don't need it. Okay, you don't need the sprinkling in order to fulfill the mitzvah of the korban pesach. But wait a minute, what do you need the sprinkling for? to eat it at night. Remember, we said it's very important to eat the Pesach at night. Well, now they say, so has Alamai, so what does he need the sprinkling for? Not to do the Korban. And it's, right? We thought he needed the sprinkling to allow him to be part of the Korban Pesach. No, you could be part of the Korban Pesach even without the sprinkling. What do you need the sprinkling for? La'chila, in order to eat it at night. And what are they telling you now? Achila Pesach and Lama Akva. It's not Ma'akev. In other words, you can fulfill the Korban Pesach. It's true, you're supposed to eat it. But if you don't eat it, it's fine. At least you did the Korban Pesach. So now what happens? You're on your seventh day. You can have people slaughter the Pesach for you. You can't go to the temple because you're Tamei. But you have people do it for you. You don't eat it that night because you didn't sprinkle, right? Because you can't sprinkle because it's Shabbat. That's why we don't allow you to sprinkle because you basically go ahead and do it a little bit differently. You can't eat it, but okay, so you don't eat it. But you can have someone do the Korban Pesach. And therefore, if you don't do it, and even if you didn't sprinkle, if you don't do it, you're going to get carried. Okay, so that's how they explain this in the end. Which then, there's no question from the RL, because it's then the same as the RL, and that you don't even need that whole thing that we that Rabbi tried to explain earlier. So now, okay, we're at the very end of the difficult part of today's stuff, then we can speed through the rest. Um, okay, this is actually already easy. But wait a minute. Didn't we just say that... The Pesach then will be slaughtered. Shalola Ochlav. We already learned. You can't slaughter the Pesach for people who can't eat it. This person can't eat it because they didn't sprinkle the blood yet. The waters yet. The purification waters. So I keep confusing the sprinkling of the blood, the sacrifice. Right? They didn't sprinkle the waters on him. So, Those are two different things. There's number one. Shalola Ochlav means someone who physically can't eat. This person can physically eat. He just can't for halachic reasons because he didn't fix himself. So that's different, okay? So we've answered that question. Now we want to go back to the Mishnah. We had Rabbi Lezer and Rabbi Kiva. Rabbi Lezer tried to say it overrides Shabbat. Rabbi Kiva said it doesn't override Shabbat. He says anything you could do from before doesn't override Shabbat. So now, we, and then we ended with this klal and Rabbi Akiva, anything you could do from before Shabbat doesn't override Shabbat. I'm Rabbi Yudha Marav, halacha ke Rabbi Akiva. We paskin like Rabbi Akiva. Utna nami gabe milah ki agavna. And as we said before, by Brit Milah, it says the exact same thing. Even though Rabbi Lezer disagrees, we hold like Rabbi Akiva, that it doesn't override Shabbat. Klal amar Rabbi Akiva, kom lacha shepshah lafsotam e'erab Shabbat, e'na doche et ha-Shabbat. Milah she'ev shah lafsotam e'erab Shabbat, doche et ha-Shabbat. Right? The Brit Milah itself, you can't do it yesterday because it was only day number seven. It doesn't override Shabbat. But the Machshirim, right, anything you could have done bringing the knife to the shul where you're going to do the Brit Milah, doesn't override Shabbat. 
And also there, Rabbi, Yehuda, uh, Rabbi, Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda said in the name of Rav, we pass on like Rabbi Akiva. So now, the obvious question, why does he have to say it there and say it here? Aren't they the same? So it's Rikha. You need it. Now we're going to have to do why, if we said in each case, you wouldn't say the same in the other. Utsricha. Yishmina gabe Pesach. There's something about Brit Milah. We've seen this before. The word breed appears three, 13 times in the text there when Avram gets commanded. So we assume, oh, there's like 13 covenants. This is super important. Therefore, you might have thought maybe we hold the Korbeli Ezer specifically there if we only had it by Pesach. Right? So Pesach doesn't have that. You might not have needed it, whereas Brit Milah, we might say it overrides. And Yashmina Mila, so what if we said it by Brit Milan, then you'd know if it doesn't override there, it certainly won't override Pesach. Well, no, because there's a Chumar by Pesach that isn't by Brit Mila. You might have said, Hatem hu do'ach shere mitzvah lo dachu shabbat, deleka karet. Ava Pesach deika karet, ema lidche, tzricha. So you might have said there, machshire mitzvah don't override Shabbat there because there's no karet associated. Now, there is karet with Brit Mila, but it doesn't kick in on day number eight. It kicks in if you don't do Brit Mila when you turn 13 and you don't take care of it yourself. Okay, if your father didn't take care of it for you, then you're responsible. But it doesn't kick in on day number eight. And therefore, you might have thought it overrides. And that's why you needed both. Okay, very briefly, we'll do this next Mishnah. I'll also, I'll go over it again in tomorrow's daf. When do you bring a Korban Chagiga? There was something called a Chagiga, your Dalit, we'll talk about a lot more in tomorrow's daf, that you would bring together with the Korban Pesach on the 14th. Chagiga is a type of Shlamim that the owners eat. It comes under three conditions. If your dollar falls on a week, weekday, if the community is all toorim and not that the majority are tomeim and it's overridden, and bimuat, when you don't have enough meat, because this was meant to have more meat to supplement the Korban Pesach, which we'll see tomorrow why that is. So these are the opposite of those three. If it's Shabbat, if it's uh, there's a lot of meat, notice the order is different. I won't get into that, but talks about the quantity of the meat second here, and the first part it talks about third, and betuma, and if people are impure. These are three differences between the Korban Chagiga and the Korban Pesach. Korban Pesach was only brought from the, from the sheep family, right, the lambs and the goats, whereas this could be brought also from the cattle. Um, the Korban Pesach was only brought male, this could be male or female. Korban Pesach was only eaten for two, were, for that night, and this is eaten for two days and the night in between. And another difference we'll see in the Gemara is Pesach has to be within the first year of the animal, and this could be even if the animal's older. So all these differences, tomorrow you'll see that this Mishnah only goes with one opinion. There's another opinion that says the Chagiga has to be exactly like the Pesach. With that, we'll finish our complicated daf for today. Shabbat Shalom to everybody.